Uh, it's half past seven now. <laughs> so, well, um, this is the last, very last session of You Are Not Alone Summit. And um, <laughs> we have a very, very, very special um, speaker for the closing session, Neil Labour with us uh, tonight. Hello, Neil. <laughs> hello, hello. <laughs> hello, everybody out there. <laughs> Sorry, Neil. It was Neil. It was quite sudden because we were talking <laughs> before, and then I always change. Oh, it's seven thirty. Oh, now let's talk about the session. And um, so we talked about it um, a little bit. But how how um, how's your week been? I've had. Thank you for asking. Uh, and I've had a great week because when the sun comes out, I feel so good. And I did what every single British person did. I put the tables and chairs outside. I put the paddling pool out for my kids, yeah, and um, I just ate um, lunch and dinner outside in the garden this week, you know, so I'm just a typical, you know, the sun's out and I go mad, because um, I need it, you know, it's been, you know, it's been a lot, it feels like a long winter, mm. um, but yeah, I'm, I'm doing really good, I'm doing really good, and I, I was um, very much looking forward to tonight, um, I've been really looking forward to kind of speaking and um yeah it's been on my mind you know today like i wanted to you know in a good way in a good way like i was thinking about it at breakfast and lunch and then dinner and i always get a bit of anticipation before <laughs> you know i'm talking even though i can't see anybody <laughs> really. um so i i'm at, i am actually very good uh, i'm not just saying it i'm, I'm really good at the moment mm. uh, thank you for asking well, um, thank you. Um, um, first of all, thank you so much for um, accepting my invitation to, to speak at the summit, because I know I did sneakily and um, looked into um, your profile on this professional speakers um, website. And I, I was shocked by how much, um, you know, all these brands and, you know, worldwide companies, you know, um, pay you to ask you to, to speak for, for half an hour, for an hour, and you are doing it pro bono. Um, and you, you agreed to do it at, at the very, 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 you know, first invitation without any asking anything further. You said it was for good causes and you wanted to do it. And that meant so much to me. <laughs> so thank you so much. No, well, of course, like, you know, I'm sure we're going to maybe tell people a little bit, you know, how we met, if you want to go into that. But yeah, this year, you know, um, I'll be honest, I've had a lot more time on my hands, um, as a lot of people might have done. And um, yeah, you know, it's really important, I think, if um, obviously, I'm going to tell my story and, uh, you know, why I'm on why I'm talking today. But I think it's really important, any invitation, any invitation, you know, I always try and get back to really as quickly as I can. I feel very privileged that I can, you know, have a voice about this um, and it's a responsibility. And of course, you know, um, what you're doing is so great. There's so many people um, who are putting on these kind of events and conferences. And I think the way you're doing it, I could see straight away, it's very genuine and yeah, in a heartbeat, I want to just contribute to this conversation that you've been running all week. And I hope that it really helps. Yeah, I can't stop smiling. I think if I if I just try, <laughs> um, then I think I will look like, ah, <laughs> the best smile. Thank you so much for that. Um, so just want to talk a little bit about how I first met you, Neil. So you and Johnny came to John Lewis Finance um, sort of um, staff conference. Um, it was a sort of day and um, event that we had at Museum of London. And actually, many colleagues already watched you and Johnny's documentary on Channel 4, and they were already talking before you guys actually um, turned up at the stage. And they were like, oh, I saw them on TV. And I was like, because I'm Korean, I don't really actually watch many um, TV. I watch a lot of rubbish TV shows, but um, I don't watch important ones. And I was like, oh, what is this? And then you two started talking on suicide. And then I was like, right, <laughs> this is a suicide. They're talking on suicide. And hearing your story actually made me feel rather brave. And, um, you know, you, you kind of remember that I actually went, you know, and came to you after after your talk to, to say hi and to talk about my, my father. And I think 
that actually might have been almost um, except counselors, obviously, but um, might have been the first time that I, I talked to anyone that wasn't my um, my family or my my um, partner and, and, and so on. And, and I, I was just talking to you that my dad also took his own life and you were, you, you were listening. And I think even when my colleagues were sort of around the, the tables, I think I was crying a little bit talking about it because you made me feel sort of understood. <laughs> yeah, well, I I, I, I've got to say, I remember actually the conversation a lot. Um, you know, you, um, you know, when you, you meet somebody through these sorts of events that you're talking about, um, you know, we're going into different organisations, could be schools or, um, you know, universities or workplaces and you know, you do in the days where we were seeing people, uh, you do, you have a lot of conversations. And I, I'm very, um, that when we spoke that day after the event, you know, I was thinking about it a lot because, um, yeah, you were emotional. You were, you were emotional. I could tell it took a lot of courage when you came up and spoke because um, I, I remember you had somebody with you and we were talking about this a couple of uh, weeks ago when we were planning this, this chat today. And, I said, you know, there was definitely somebody by your side that you were like a friend or a colleague or somebody and you were saying, oh, I can't remember, I can't remember. But obviously because, you know, that's, that's what happens when you're um, talking about something very emotional. It is hard to remember the details around it, actually. Um, and but when you're on when you're on the receiving end, if you're listening, um, yeah, I always remember some really powerful conversations with a lot of clarity. Uh, I didn't remember your name, I'll be honest, because it was a couple of years ago, and I'll put my hands up to that one. Um, so when you contacted me, um, yeah, it was like, again, just this serendipitous moment, which we're going to talk about moments of, you know, uh, serendipity, um, which is why I'm here. It was, it was just one of those moments. It was like, what are the chances somebody that you have a random conversation with contacts you years later and yeah like I said I feel like there's something at play there that you've got to go along with it um and then we talked more you know you told me your story recently you know about your father and yeah you know I've been around a lot of conversations around suicide so um yeah I, I can understand I can understand exactly why you wanted to do this 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 piece today and so here we are <laughs> thank you neil um it actually means a lot that someone understands <laughs> because you know i also had a lot of feedback all really like kind of feedback but um like well, why are you doing it like you know you, that's so much work like why are you doing it like you and and stuff and but i think you know some people like yourself and many people who tuned in um throughout um the the summit sort of period and who watched it back on youtube i think they get why someone like me or some other people so many people out there are doing something like this this is so important to us and um, so i actually have a couple of really um almost quite touching videos uh, uh that you're talking about that that moment and um, but um before we um play that would you like to maybe share with the audience who you know who's watching um tonight and then who will be watching back later on on youtube that who you are a little bit. I, I, I suspect that many people already know you, but um, just to, in your own words, like where do you live, what do you do, and <laughs> please. Sure. Well, yeah. Thank you. I mean, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't expect anybody to know me. I do, um, yeah, have a um, a public profile within mental health, within mental health and well-being. You know, but apart, aside from that. No, I wouldn't expect anybody to know to know me, and and there's, you know especially in London and the UK as well, and you know we've travelled around a little bit, um, and I'll talk about a bit of the work <clears throat> later. But for now, so I'm 38 years old. I keep having to <laughs> to remember 38. Um, I've just moved to West Sussex by the coast um, in the UK, and um, yeah, I've got two really small children. We were just talking about that before. George is one, Sophia is three, 
uh, keeping me super busy, super distracted from anything, uh, you know, which is really good for my well-being, actually. Uh, married to Sarah, my wife. We've been together coming up about 15 years now. We've been married for about eight years. Um, uh, if I got that right, probably 2014, we got married, so seven years. Um, yeah, and um, typical family man, really. Um, spent a lot of time working working in London, and um, which is which is where I started getting involved in first conversation about suicide, and then further about mental health. Um, it might be it might be good to kind of like start at the beginning. It's a good good place to start. So I started working in in Covent Garden in London because I started as a personal trainer in two thousand and seven. So um, yeah, I was uh, I grew up in Watford in Hertfordshire, and um, <clears throat> when I got my personal training qualifications, you know, I, I, I moved closer to London. So I could just, just start working. My first job was um, cleaning treadmills, doing gym inductions and all of the menial tasks that they give a new Jimmy to do uh, at Virgin Active Health Club on the Strand. So I started working in 2007 and winter time in November and around the Christmas time um, <clears throat> had a couple of weeks off and I came back to work in January in 2000 and eight and um before that point in my life so i'm about 2008 now 25 years old okay and i don't know anything about mental health about suicide um at all to be honest you know nothing at all none of my friends ever talked about it i didn't you know necessarily um yeah have any any issues myself um or family members that did never never talk never talked about it and it was never something we spoke about at school so yeah my involvement kind of came about quite abruptly so i was walking i was walking to work on my first day back in 2008 over waterloo bridge in the morning and uh that's where i walked past a guy sitting on Waterloo Bridge who was obviously, well, obviously in my mind, um, probably about to take his life, sitting on the edge of the bridge. And what happened next, uh, some people will call um, a suicide intervention. Um, it was just a chat. As far I didn't have a name for it, it was just a chat. <clears throat> so, yeah, that uh, I started talking to this guy on Waterloo Bridge. I just, I just walked up and I just started a conversation. And in that kind of thirty minutes that we talked on the bridge, about nine o'clock on the fourteenth of January in the morning on two thousand and eight, I, um, I was just really in this bubble with him. You know, he was. Um, he was really distraught and he could barely speak at first. His eyes were red and, you know, he, he was obviously there to end his life and he told me that. And as the conversation went on, we started to just connect, I think. We just started to connect. And towards the end of the conversation, um, I felt like we had a bond. Really, honestly, truly, like I felt like this was a guy that I kind of known for a while. You know, we he he'd come out of his shell. We were talking. I was feeling more comfortable, you know, in my skin there in that moment, and um, I kind of just felt like I was talking to somebody I knew. But yeah, he was still on the bridge, and I was still, you know, talking and talking to him. So anyway, um, I suggested that we would go and have a coffee and. Uh, yeah, he said, he said, okay. And he stepped down from the bridge and um, we, we were about to go to have, have this coffee and somebody had called the police during this time, I think. Um, anyway, the police turned up and, you know, they really quickly took over. So this guy, Johnny, who you mentioned, this guy was uh, arrested, was sectioned 
and he was taken to St. Thomas Hospital and um, he was, yeah, detained and uh, he was he was put back into psychiatric hospital. And um, yeah, I kind of uh, gave my statement to the police and went back to work. So, you know, that happens on the 14th of January, 2008. And then it's back to me not knowing anything about mental health again. I rarely discussed that moment with anybody outside of my family. Um, I just didn't feel it was something, you know, just to kind of talk about, you know, trivially. You know, it was really important, you know, it was really impactful for me, that conversation, never having spoken about suicide ever in my life before that. And six years went by and um, yeah, I just, uh, I, you know, I had this, I had this really distant memory of this, this conversation on Waterloo Bridge and um, I was still working in Covent Garden now in, tw in 2014, six years later, I was still working in Covent Garden and one random day, <laughs> Uh, I saw this guy Johnny turn up on Facebook, you know, on my on my Facebook feed that had been shared again and again and again and again and again, and completely viral. And um, he was searching for the guy that talked him off Waterloo Bridge. And I came forward. Um, it's quite funny because he was searching for a guy called Mike. He thought my name was Mike. <laughs> so he'd called this campaign Find Mike. And obviously my name's Neil. So, um, you know, the campaign for him, like, had taken all different twists and turns. Like, he had actually people called Mike who thought that it was him they talked of a bridge, even though it was somebody else they talked of a bridge that came forward. So, um, yeah, anyway, I I got in touch um, through this post, through this charity that he was working with. And, you know, we ended up having that coffee, which was a completely different conversation than the first time. Because like I said, the first time, I didn't know it was a suicide intervention. I, I, I wasn't going into it thinking, oh, there's an outcome, let me talk this guy off the bridge. I literally just walked up because I was interested and intrigued and I thought I could help. I didn't know what the end goal was to that conversation. Um, but like I said, it was yeah a really tough conversation that got easier. But when we met in 2014, when he did the Find Mike campaign, which went global, it trended all around the world. And that particular week, it was trending above uh, Barack Obama, and it was trending above Beyonce. There was, they were in the news about something. So I, I was bigger than Beyonce for about five minutes, which was pretty cool. Um, yeah, when we met, it was a completely different conversation because he had somewhat recovered. You know, I think I understand enough to say, like, I don't think there's such a thing as recovery if you have a serious mental health diagnosis. You learn to manage it, you learn to live with it. Like you learn to live with a lot of other health issues you know but he'd come a long way and he was a different person you know in a good way you know and he sat down and we sat down for probably over an hour and just you know he just told me everything about his life and everything and it was really 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 inspiring and it was that moment in January in 2014 that my I don't know career in mental health began completely by accident what a journey. I, I don't want to sound a cliche, um, Neil, but it sounds like a movie. I know it was a real story, but just to, all of these, you know, you know, you were just walking on the bridge, walking on the bridge to, to go to work and, and you, you came across um, Johnny and without having any pre prior experience um, of any mental health, you just uh, had a child with him and, <laughs> and six years later, uh, what happened? Um, yeah, it's just what a journey. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I've watched some really dull movies, so uh, I'm sure the plot could uh, challenge me. It's funny you say that because at the time, um, you know, I can tell you a bit about what happened afterwards, but, um, 
you know, we there was loads of press around it because it was a real feel good story. You know, the fact that somebody had intervened in this suicide attempt and it turned out really well. And Johnny, he's a really charismatic guy, actually. He's really good. And he was doing a lot of advocacy work and he was doing a lot of campaigning. And he'd already been on BBC and done a BBC Three documentary about mental health. Um, and so he, he was doing a lot. He was doing a lot in the space. And um, somebody, I think Paramount Studios had actually called him and asked to buy his life rights to make a film. <laughs> um, I think that fizzled out. Like, I'm not sure if anything happened there, but that was that would be between him and Paramount. But apparently that's what these film studios do. I didn't know this. Like, they will, you know, see stories in the press and say like, well, that's really interesting. Let's go and buy the the the, the rights to that in case we make a movie 10 or 20 years later. So you never know. <laughs> I'm sure um, if if a film um, you know um, comes out one day, it, it won't be just to um, join your promise, but you will be there. And, you know, I know you want to get up, but you will be there. <laughs> um, so I I have this um, video um, of sort of you and Johnny um, meeting up again six six years after uh, what happened on the bridge. So I'll just try to share my screen just to show the audience and. Um, Hiya. Hi, John. How are you doing? Yeah, yeah. I'm ready. How are you? All right. Yeah? All right. Good. Good. Really? It all makes sense. <laughs> Can I help you? Yeah, sorry. Do you just want Yeah. No, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. It's, it's fantastic, Steve. It's fantastic. Really good. Really good. I'm so nervous. Yeah. I saw you on the TV. Yeah, I saw you speaking on the TV. Don't be nervous, aren't you? No. It's really nice things you said, and you know, um, it's yeah, it's so strange to see you again. But you know, yeah, it seems like only good things have happened for you. So yeah, but well, do you want to take a seat? Yeah, absolutely. Wow. Uh, how are you doing? How are you doing? I'm fine. I'm fine. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks so much for. Uh... uh... God, it's all coming back. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Wow. Well, I imagine how it must feel, you know, to to be reliving it, you know. Sorry. No. Yeah. It's just it's unbelievable. Because really. oh my god, it's like you know. You, do you do you remember me? Yeah. Now I've seen you. Like it's all coming back. Really. You standing inside of me, and um, so strange because it feels like. To say it feels like kind of. <laughs> We're friends, and yet, yeah, it's the only second time I met you. Well, I have a feeling we will be now, yeah, yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, so can you see me again? Mm -hmm. I can, yeah. Ah, okay, so, um, as, as I said, um, to you, Neil, previously, whenever I watch this video, I I become emotional um, it's it's very touching and um, yeah so please tell us a little bit about the the sort of re reunion because you know I, I can obviously see that there were like lots of cameras and, and stuff like the filming your reunion with Johnny again how 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 did you feel when you um, when you were meeting him again yeah it all happened again um, so by accident <clears throat> and you know what happened after that meeting like you couldn't you couldn't make it up really um we didn't know like <clears throat> how well we would actually get on you know we were strangers essentially and i just remember i just remember this 30 minute conversation on the bridge obviously i remember liking him thinking you know he was a nice guy and, and everything but yeah i didn't know anything about him but after we met um johnny was working for a mental health charity called Rethink Mental Illness. They were doing a lot of campaign work and um, yeah I I kind of started getting involved with the charity um, and they would say like you know guys we, we're getting um, inundated with um, requests for, for you know people just to talk about talk about this story you know the news newspapers to do little pieces and stuff like that and um, because that clip that you saw 
was actually um, the end of a documentary. And to be honest, it was mostly Johnny in that documentary because they shot all of it before I actually came forward. Um, he was doing his second feature documentary around suicide and, um, you know, the search for me and everything like that with the charity. And they, they didn't know if, if this, the, you know, the right guy was going to come forward. And it was like, he always said it was like a needle in a haystack. So, you know, this charity, this, this, um, <clears throat> this um, documentary had gone out on Channel 4. Um, and I didn't know when I met him and I sat down in, on that video, I knew they were filming and everything. And I was like, yeah, fine. You know, this, this is, this is fine. I didn't know how much it was going to propel our story and that that documentary that the charity shot ended up being commissioned by channel four and it went on and it's, you know, it went on like prime time for like a week and then, you know, it was on, it's still on more for now. And, um, <clears throat> you know, so we were getting inundated with requests and obviously people wanted to speak to both of us together. They wanted to understand about Johnny's mental health. They wanted to understand why he was suicidal. They wanted to ask somebody who'd intervened successfully, what did you say? How did you do it? What's the magic formula? How do you save somebody's life? You know, and um, I went along with it all. I, I said yes to every request because I just wanted to get to know Johnny. I just wanted to spend more time with him and get to know him. Um, and that, that whole kind of first year was like a whirlwind because I was I had a lot in my life going on. Like I was running my own business in Covent Garden. You know, I had people working for me. I was planning to get married that year. You know, I had my honeymoon booked and, um, you know, but, and, you know, I was, I was doing this day job as well, but, you know, I was, I was ended up doing more and more work with Johnny around suicide awareness. Then I was doing personal training. And so, you know, there was a tipping point and, you know, we decided, you know, we decided that we were going to basically kind of team up full time and just kind of be a voice that could um, shine a light on this conversation and um, that kind of tipping point really happened around the end of 2016 so by this time you know I'd known him a couple of years um, we'd become really good friends and we traveled up and down the country using our story to go in and you know <clears throat> uh, start a conversation we were doing stuff on behalf of the charity, Rethink Mental Illness. We were both ambassadors now for the charity. And we uh, we went out and got pissed together. We did lots of drinking. We went to lots of university towns. We spoke to lots of students. And it was really weird. And I, I was spending a lot of time away from home as well, which, um, you know, I look back on and I'm a bit like, oh, you know, I did spend a lot of time away from, from my wife, you know, but it was it was for a good reason, you know, it's a really, really good reason. And I think we had to like go out and, you know, let off steam in the evenings because we would go and tell our story, like you saw at John Lewis and maybe 20 people would come up at the end and want to talk to us about if they'd lost somebody through suicide or if they'd been suicidal themselves or if they were just struggling with, you know, something. And um, it was really tough. Um, so we like, we used to let off steam, you know, uh, we used to let off steam and go out and, and that's how we bonded. Like, that's how we kind of forged our friendship together. And then, um, and then, yeah, by about, you know, the beginning of 2017, we were just, we were just doing loads, loads and loads and loads and loads and loads. Um, and we were kind of, I guess now full-time mental health advocates, and uh, I never went back. I never went back to personal training. And um, I've ended up ever since just kind of like, yeah, being involved, being involved um, in, um, in, in any way, shape or form, kind of advocating that people have awareness around suicide or looking after their mental health. And um, that's kind of continued to this day, really. Um, that's, that's amazing, you know. <laughs> 
That's truly amazing. But, um, so you talked a little bit about um, this sort of suicide, you know, prevention work you do, and um, we join you together, you're good friends now, and the charity work and, you know, um, talks for universities and major corporations, etc. So please tell us a little bit about what, what that involves, because you travel off a lot, you're invited, you know, by other countries to, to come and speak at their conferences and events. So what, what, what do you do with them and what's your charity work <clears> for? Sure, okay, yeah. I mean, like, there's actually so much I've got to try and think about, um, you know, I guess like the, the kind of the, the tipping points for us um, that have made a big difference. Um, you know, in uh, in 2017, actually in late 2016, the the, the young royals, uh, the royal family, they were doing a lot around mental health. Prince William and um, so the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, so Catherine, um, were doing a lot around mental health and they launched the Heads Together campaign, which, you know, went global, but in, here in the UK, it was really, really big. And they, they sponsored the London Marathon um, that year, Heads Together through the Royal Foundation. And we were at this event, we were at this event one day with, uh, we, we, we'd been lucky they wanted to meet us in person. So um, Johnny got this phone call from the Royal Household saying, Prince William wants to meet you. And uh, he called me and said, this is crazy. Like they want to meet us and start learning about, you know, suicide before they do this campaign. And um, so we got invited to this other event. And when we learned that they were doing the, um, the marathon and they were, you know, headlining it with their charity, I just turned to Johnny and said, let's run the London Marathon together. And uh, he was like, what? Uh, I've never run five kilometers. And I said, don't worry, mate. I was a personal trainer. I just finished personal training. I said, we'd be good, we'll do a training plan, you know. So we signed up for London Marathon and we started fundraising. Uh, and that became a big focus for like, um, yeah, a good sort of six months of the year. We just kept, you know, uh, we would do lots of events. We would try to fundraise as much as possible at those events um and um you know like dinners and you know talk and we would give talks and stuff but also through this like we were learning so like we were learning a lot about how to have a conversation how to hold a conversation and i think it turned into a point where companies or organizations felt comfortable to invite us in and talk to their staff because um sometimes they just don't know how to speak about this themselves so they bring in other people to speak about it so we got to april and we had to run 26 miles but johnny had had a really terrible year uh, he'd gone into hospital psychiatric hospital had a relapse he was suicidal again like weeks before the marathon so he didn't train he didn't do any training um he came out of hospital and he did a run like like a five kilometer run like a week before the marathon and I was like oh my god like it's going to be so dreadful for him it's going to be awful anyway we started the marathon that day and you know we were really proud of ourselves we raised like forty thousand pounds which you know we were like we were super excited we had a target of 100 we didn't quite get there but we raised forty thousand for the heads together charity and you know we were doing lots of work with the royal household and like pr campaigns to you know get it alive and um it was me that kind of uh i got i i let the team down i got really bad cramp about 15 miles in and uh, I had to slow down and Johnny ended up kind of just running the whole way with me. I had to like run and walk and run and walk. Um, and we were side by side the whole way down through the London Marathon in 2017. So that was a, like, that was a big like moment for us because we ran underneath Waterloo Bridge at one point where we'd met three years earlier. And it was really emotional for the pair of us, you know. Um, so yeah and then um you know we done a lot with mind the mental health charity and um 
you know, been on a lot of different like steering groups and boards and stuff, trying to just, you know, give some insight into our experiences of, of always having conversations with people who are suicidal through these events. And then eventually we just decided we'd always talked about doing our own thing, having our own charity. Uh, we'd, we, we'd always talked about it, but we'd always had so much work on our plate and we, you know, it was never the right time. And, you know, I, I was looking at starting a family or Johnny was, you know, not uh, doing well or something, you know, but we decided just to do it, just to put a board together. We, we, you know, we said, right, who are like five or six people that we just trust that can just really help us. People that we met who were involved in mental health. We had people on the board who'd been bereaved by suicide, you know, um, and we just put this board together and we just launched this charity. And it's gone from strength to strength. And uh, Johnny is now the full-time chairman of the charity. And um, it's amazing the work that, you know, has been done there. This year there was a schools festival and, um, you know, it was one of the biggest festival, like mental health festivals. It had to be online, obviously, but they had a thousand schools involved in February this year. You know, so um, I kind of had other work commitments. So I stepped away after um, about a year and a half, but it was set up, it was running and it's still doing incredible things at the moment, to be honest. So we really, we are just so proud now that there's this, there's this charity and it's funded and it exists. And if we stop doing anything together tomorrow, that's our legacy, you know, and all the money goes to youth and prevent and prevention so it funds, you know, school projects, youth projects, and it really gets people talking about mental health at a young age, because that's where, you know, we need to learn about, about this sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, that's, you know, that's probably one or two big highlights about, about the charity work that, that we've done. Um, well, it just sounds like such amazing work, um, you know, to educate the kids from from a young age, so they they are aware of you know mental health and stuff. Because we, I think we are about the same similar age, Neil, but um, we haven't had that chance. It it, it wasn't taught at school, or um, I don't know how you know culture wise, it might be a bit different. The UK and Korea, I actually don't think there's much difference there. That almost mental health or suicide or depression, anxiety, any sort of you know conditions we could have were completely almost sort of taboo. Don't talk about it. <laughs> Just don't talk about it. Um, um, so yeah, it's amazing to hear that the charity that you you set up with Johnny is doing amazing work for for kids to educate them and so on with the festivals and stuff. Well, yeah, I mean, I've certainly seen different challenges in different um, places that we've been. Um, uh, you know, we um, you know we recently went over to, to Asia. Actually, um, I don't know. I'm I'm sure I told you when I spoke before, but we were in Thailand. I don't know. Have you ever been to Thailand? Yeah. So we were doing we were doing um, work with an organisation. They have a really big inpatient facility in Thailand for people who are struggling. You know, like a um, kind of like a residential place, like the Priory over here. But while we were over there, we wanted to connect with people who were doing more kind of like you know stuff in the um, community. And I met, uh, we met um, somebody from um, who was in charge of doing all the mental health training for kind of like uh, all UN um, and kind of ambassador work and stuff through like foreign Commonwealth office and, and you know, and um, yeah, we were learning everywhere we go, we try and learn about the culture of, of mental health, but of suicide as well. And we keep hearing again and again, like I know we're, we're uneducated in the UK and it has stigma, but I feel like it's just amplified in other countries. And that's been the experience, you know, we've done a fair bit of work in um, some countries in Europe and specifically Lithuania. You know, we would go back there uh, because they've got one of the highest suicide rates in Europe. And um, there's this amazing uh, guy who is a professor who works for Vilnius University. Vilnius is the capital of Lithuania. And he's constantly putting on global um, 
event for the suicide awareness community and you know so we've been involved as much as we could and you learn that like um it's very it's almost like you're not even allowed to talk about it you know it's like there's so much shame so much shame and I know it was probably like that here before I was alive you hear about it like oh you know if somebody died by suicide you would pretend they died of something else you know um but in my lifetime I I don't think we've quite experienced that here I think you know we we're aware of how many people die by suicide it's very public we've got amazing public health campaigns here like the time to change campaign or you know like the royal family i mean they were out there just talking about suicide in 2017 and 18 you know like this is really um normalizing the conversation but that's still not happening in other countries even in europe like really close to us you know especially like eastern europe you know and even some western european countries when i've been into um workplaces and we've and we've done lots of work with companies in the uk we've tried to branch out and do stuff in their european offices so for example like switzerland uh, milan um, paris and every time i speak to somebody in the european offices and I'm generalizing here, I kind of get a lot of feedback that the culture is very different here. It's very different. We don't talk about stress and mental health at work. You know, people just lie. They say they've got muscular pains. They say they've got a headache. They don't come in. Nobody, nobody takes time off because of stress here. It's complete taboo. So yeah, I mean like, the, you know, there's, there's always, always gonna be work to do around the globe because uh, you may have talked about this in other sessions, but around the world, you know, somebody takes their life, something like uh, every 40 seconds, somebody takes their life around the world. You know, so it's a huge, it's a huge, huge, huge global epidemic. I think something like 800,000 people annually take their life around the world. So, you know, it is, you know, huge. Um, but anyway, so yeah, there's always lots of work to do. And I can't imagine, you know, I can't imagine never, uh, never, never stopping to some degree doing this work. You know, I always want to have a voice, even if it's in 20 years time and our story gets heard for the first time by somebody in, you know, Korea <laughs> or America or down the road in Sussex where I live. If nobody's heard it and they say, wow, okay, that's really made me think. And they start to like, you know, talk about it and it stops someone taking their life because they reach out and they get help. That's the point. That's really the point. Thanks, Neil. Um, that's amazing um, to hear, you know, what amazing work you are doing um, across the, um, the world, not just um, within the UK. Um, we have a question from the audience, um, Lisa. Hi, Lisa. Mm -hmm. Um, I think this relates to the um, festival you were talking about, you know, by the charity that you set up with Johnny. From what age of children are you working? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question. So um, really all ages. I mean, from the age they can talk, to be honest, um, you know, pr um, primary schools, um, to be honest, have, you know, we, we ourselves have been into schools and talking you know spoken to children i think i've spoken to children as, as young as six or seven um and you know when we've when we've told our story obviously you know we don't talk about um things like you know jumping off a bridge or um you know <clears throat> johnny would speak about his his mental health like his you know suicide but you know so we have to we have to uh, change the language a little bit but yeah like any age it's really important because if you're going to normalize it you've got to talk to children about their feelings like you do anything else um and so you know we've supported lots of um lots of charities who go in to schools and um set up set up spaces to talk to children you know as young as as young as primary school really in fact sometimes it's easier because they know that they don't really understand much we've had a lot you know in my experience <clears throat> if you're engaging with a school 
they'll say, okay, well, we want to talk about it, but can you not talk about suicide because we don't want to, you know, kind of give, you know, encourage children to, to, you know, take their life. But you're, that's, you're doing the opposite. If you don't, if you don't acknowledge it, they're never going to feel it's normal to talk about. Um, so yeah, all ages, um, all different kinds of projects, um, funding all different initiatives. But to be honest, you don't have to talk about mental health like we are now to a really, really young person, you know. <clears throat> You've just got to be open, like talking about like feelings and you know, and 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 then and then grow and then grow on that and grow on that and grow on that. And you know, if they want to explore things, you know, you just you I don't think anything should be off limits at any age, especially if the child brings it up themselves you know, and say, okay, well, you know, we don't talk about that. You know, you've got to let them have a very normal conversation about this, because that's where it all starts. One in 10 mental health issues here in the UK begins in adolescence. Sorry, nine in 10. Nine in 10 mental health issues begin in adolescence. So, you know, that's when you need to talk about it. Um, just on that, Neil, um, so your um, little girl, um, is it Sophia? Is that right? Sophia, Sophia, Sophia yeah. So, Sophia, so does she know? I mean, she, I, I guess she's actually really young because she's only three years old, but does she know what you do? No, no, she doesn't care. <laughs> <laughs> she, she doesn't care about you know, it. No, I mean, there's no, there's no cognition for her to... Um, <laughs> Yeah, and actually, do you know what? It's the one thing, like the, the interaction with the three-year-old Sophia. It's the one. It's a space where, like, I can just forget about um, some of the stuff that we talk about, you know. Um, but I do, I do talk to her about her feelings. You know, she doesn't know I'm doing it. You know, I ask her all the time, like, how? Like, I ask her, like, um, what makes you feel? happy and then like she would say something and then I say like what makes you feel sad you know and then I asked her once like what makes you feel scared and I, I could see her eyes like thinking you know it was fascinating because um it's just like a game you know to her like and it's exploring it in a fun way so it's not scary and you know but I, you've got to balance it out you know so I might say yeah if I'm asking her about a happy thing, I ask her about a sad thing. If I'm asking her about a sad thing, I ask her about a happy thing. You know, and I try to have a bit of balance, but no, she's got no idea. But, um, you know, maybe she'll ask me when she's four or five or six, whatever, but I won't, I won't sugarcoat it. I'll, you know, I'll say to her, um, you know, this is what I do. And if it feels right, I'll say, I am a suicide campaigner. And if she says, what suicide daddy? I would just tell her. It feels scary to do that, but I think that's what you've got to do, you know, this day and age, because how are we ever going to change if we're not willing to really, you know, um, yeah, change change our behaviours with, with young children. I think maybe by the time you get to like 12, 13, 14, it could even be too late. You know, you've really got to start letting them have conversations much earlier. Thanks, Neil. Um, She's more interested in Peppa Pig than what we do for work. <laughs> um, yeah, I, one day I hope that even Peppa Pig would have an episode um, about mental health <laughs> and, and suicide because that's what happens in the real world. Um, so now I think it's more about you uh, for the rest of the session, if you don't mind, Neil. So um, it sounds like your sort of change of career seems quite natural, but even though it was quite natural, if you think about it, it's actually quite really big change, complete change of, of sector or what you do, because um, you, you had a successful business and, you know, you're a personal trainer in Covent Garden, the biggest part of London, and to become a mental health trainer, um, you know, mental health campaigner and suicide campaigner. Um, so how, how did that sort of... Um, um, what I was going to ask is that um, when you were young, did you hear that from many people before you even became a mental health campaigner that you 
I don't know, you listen well or you have something um, that, that makes people feel relaxed or something? Yeah, do you know, no, I had no idea actually. Um, I, have, I had no idea because I did all sorts of different jobs um, and, you know, I didn't actually um, get any, I got my, tra- my fitness qualification. I did my GCSEs and I got my fitness qualification years later in between school and when I was like early 20s I did like construction work and you know I was a bit lost in my career I didn't I didn't really have much you know direction to be honest but, you know my parents like they supported anything and you know I went to college but I dropped out because I got behind on my work and I just got a full-time job and um, um, but I, I got into fitness because I was working, I was doing work on construction sites and I was going to the gym. And do you know why I got into it? I'll be completely honest, because I was really a skinny kid. I was really skinny and I was really ashamed of my own body. And when I was 18, I went away with my friends on holiday and we were all on the beach and I would put my T-shirt on, you know? And so like there was emotional driver. So anyway, so I started going to the gym and then when I started going to the gym and working out, I felt more confident. And then I just thought, you know, maybe I could do this as a career. I don't know. And so I naturally got into this path. But then when I, st- I didn't really understand the people side of the job. Um, and I started to, you know, um, train people and I started to be around really successful people. So in Covent Garden, you know, you've, you know, you're stone through from the city and you've got really, you know, there would be like, um yeah really really um successful people coming and and wanting training sessions so I would just get really interested in them I was I was like you know I would ask them about their business and you know sometimes I was more interested in them and their how they got to where they were than their fitness you know but in a way that helped because then we were so comfortable and I knew how to write fitness plans I could write fitness plans and nutrition plans in my sleep like it was easy you know I think the hardest part was actually like getting people to be comfortable around you but I genuinely was always really interested and I wanted to ask people and you know I always listened a lot to what people told me and I think that's where I got the inspiration to get more involved in business you know, I was just around a lot of successful people. And I thought, okay, well, I don't have any qualifications in business. I'm in my late twenties now. Um, But um, we were getting invited into companies um, like John Lewis, big banks, law firms, um, accountancy firms. We got invited to other countries around the world. And I, when I was going into these places, I was like, wow, this is a different world. Like, You know, there's a real opportunity to um, make a career here. Like, I was always going to do my charity work. You know, I was always going to do stuff to pay it back. But I was married and I wanted to have a family and I wanted to provide for them. And I was always ambitious. I'd always ran my own personal training business before I went to mental health. You know, you had to make money. You had to survive. It was very competitive. And when I went in to start talking about well-being and mental health to companies... I thought, you know what, like, they're only going to respect me being an authority here if I'm on their level. So I've got to, you know, if I'm going to continue to consult with companies and provide them solutions and help them with this mental health conversation, you know, I'm going to have to do it like a business. Otherwise, they're not going to respect me. And, you know, anyway... I just, um, yeah, I really, I really kind of took to it really well because it's a very people driven environment. Um, I love just going into different workplaces, finding out what their problems were, listening and trying to help them, you know, Um, and it just, it became, yeah, it became a kind of real passion actually in the workplace. You know, there's, you know, it's, it's really important to do stuff in youth with mental health. But I just, I always felt really comfortable in, in workplaces, um, you know, around other adults and trying to help them. And in the end, I'd been to so many companies, hundreds, that I decided, you know what, um, it's time that I brought all these people under one roof. And so I had this idea in 
uh, early 2018, uh, late 2017, actually, um, to host a conference. And I had, uh, I had a few friends in high places. So I said, you know, would you help out? And they said, of course we'll help out. Like, you know, we are an investment bank. We're making money. Like, you know, if you're asking me to help you with mental health, like it's not a conflict, easy. So, you know, I asked a lot of people for a lot of help and there's some great, there's some really amazing people out there in the workplace, you know, who they have these very stressful day jobs, but they've either been through something themselves or, you know, they just want to help people. So anyway, we started this conference and it was amazing. It was, it just took off. It just took off and it's still running today. It's going to have its one, two, three, fourth annual conference this year. And it's, yeah, it's, um, it's gone into America. It's gone into Asia and uh, really, really proud that I was able to, to start this, this movement. I mean, I, I haven't done anything. Um, help you there but just hearing that i'm so proud <laughs> just only hearing that so i have the the video of that um, amazing conference mental health which i'll play and um, let me just share my screen good morning everyone and welcome to this can happen 2018. the idea behind today is to look positively at the spectrum of workplace mental health and all that it entails. Statistically, a lot of us in this room have experienced mental health problems. And I want to thank you all in advance for taking what you learned here today back into your organisations because starting now, this can happen. Mental health affects every single person, regardless of their job title, their status, their sex, colour or nationality. We all face the same issues. It's important that we start this momentum where we just take mental health more seriously. There's still a stigma about mental health. We are chipping away at it, but that wall needs to be smashed down. And this is a fantastic forum for, for beating the stigma of mental health. They will allow you to just work 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And for me, I have to put a structure into my day. You're at the bottom of the sea, just being tumbled and tumbled, and you don't know which way is up. But somehow you've got to find which way is up. You're clearly here today and you want to do something. Make sure that you want to do it because you care, and you're genuine. Don't do it to tick a box. Do it because you actually care about people. I haven't been there, but it just, it just looks so amazing. Um, well, yeah, I mean, don't feel bad. Like nobody's been anywhere for a past year anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, Neil, I mean, I'd love to hear more, you know, from you. I, I just, you know, you, you probably don't feel that way, but it, when you say something, it just, it sort of hooks the audience. I feel it that myself. But, um, with the time, just a couple of minutes left, and you had a you had a busy you know dad with with two kids, and um, maybe just one more question before you go, if that's okay with you. Of course, of course. <laughs> um, so if there's anyone um watching this session um, but they have um suicidal thoughts which they feel that they can't stop, is there anything that you could tell them? Sure. You know the title of your summit spot on when you say you're not alone um it's so common it's so common to feel suicidal um a lot of people you know you you feel like you are the only one i think and uh there's so many people out there who are going through the exact same the exact same thing. Um, what I can say to people from the amount of people I've met over the years who have overcome their demons is that um, there's always a way to look at, you know, to look at what's going on. And tomorrow, you know, tomorrow is always another day. Um, no matter how 
no matter how bad it seems, you know, there's, you know, there's always, there's always an opportunity to see things differently. There's always an opportunity to feel different in the next moment, in the next day. And um, I'm going to take this from Johnny, to be honest, because he, he, he's got it. He just says, you know, don't be embarrassed. You know, it's your brain is, you know, kind of like giving you a problem, just like your heart is giving you a problem, just like your liver, your lungs can give you a problem. You know, we've all we've all been through this pandemic now and then there's no stigma if you got COVID, right? You know, you can't help it. You have to go and get treated or you could die, right? It's the same. If you feel suicidal, it's because you're experiencing a health issue. You know, just because it's an emotion and you can't see it, it's very real, you know, and it's an organ like any other organ, you know. So please, you know, go and go and tell somebody that you're having a health issue and you need to get help. Um, and you will get better. You will get better. You wouldn't hide it if you thought you were going to have a heart attack. You would tell someone, I think I might have a heart attack. You know, if you feel like you needed to take your life, you need, you know, you need to tell someone because there is so much help out there. And there are so many other people who have the same health issue as you do. So there's no need to be embarrassed and you are not alone. Oh, thank you so much, Neil. May I ask you one more question <laughs> before we let you go? Of course. <laughs> so um, mental health for men, as you spoke to Johnny, um, just a chat, you know, not thinking about suicide prevention or anything like that. If, um, if we see a man struggling with something, but um, they don't want to talk about it, how can we... How can we be there? Yeah, it's, it's really hard because, you know, men, um, especially, can find it difficult to open up, I think. And, um, you know, it's not surprising because um, we're taught very young age to not show emotions and thoughts and feelings. And, um, you know, I, I think... I think you just you you have to be patient and you have to be persistent um and remember that um men you know we struggle we 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 struggle to show weakness you know we struggle to show weakness and um i think it's really good for men to see other men who have gone through the same thing and come out the other side and i think if you want to help someone I think you could point them in the direction of, of other men who are talking about this. You know, there's sports stars. You look at people like Freddie Flintoff. You know, he's very, you know, you'll see him down the pub having a laugh, a boxing match. You know, he's a lad's lad. He's a man's man, you know. But he's out there talking about his depression and bulimia and, you know, all this stuff. Like, it's really brave. It's really brave. Um so there's a lot of role models out there, you know, a lot of role models and celebrities, sports stars. And, and I think, you know, if you're, if you're worried, I think, you know, you should, you should say, you know, look, I'm worried because I care about you. And I think um, if you can't talk about it, maybe, maybe just, just share some of the other things that other guys are doing and, and it could help. But I think the main thing is if you keep on just really slowly trying to be persistent and trying to get somebody to talk and open up eventually they will know that you are there if they need to reach out and I think trying to force it can sometimes make it worse so I think you just let them know um, you know this is the same for like a young man like a young teenager or a guy who's in his 20s full of testosterone and he's trying to you know prove to the world got no weakness or, you know, me, a dad, a guy, you know, lots on his plate, or somebody who's retired, you know, um, yeah, just just kind of like, just be persistent because I think you can help them to break down their walls, um, but it takes time. That's really helpful. <laughs> 
Gil, thank you so much. You honestly have my unlimited gratitude. Um, you know, you accepted this invitation, and when you when you have loads of loads of you know um, work to do, obviously as a as a as a suicide campaigner, and um, it's been really kind. You know how you supported um this um all the way along. <laughs> No, well, um, do you know what? I'll be honest, I haven't done anything. You've, um, you've done an incredible body of work, you know, 10 sessions every day, uh, and you've had your own story to deal with. And, you know, it's, uh, it, it's incredible. It's, it's so incredible, this um, summit that you've put on. It's so incredible. Um, I don't get the chance to meet people and tell them all about it, but I can tell you, when I see people in face to face, I'm going to tell them about the work you're doing and the incredible work you're doing. I haven't, you know, done anything, you know. Um, so carry on yourself, you know, being a voice out there because it's really needed. It's really, really important. And there's going to be somebody out there who I think resonates with you. You know, they might look at me and they, OK, I don't want to talk to this guy I've got no connection but it could be your voice and John yeah it could be your voice that they just need to hear so I think you need to keep on keep on doing it um and um yeah it's, it's a passion for you and I'm really I'm really proud of what you're doing oh, thank you Neil um that's that's really encouraging and I'm someone if someone encourages me I take with it so Okay. <laughs> yeah, and I'll see you. Uh, you know, I'll, I'll see you for a socially distanced beer soon, hopefully. <laughs> Gin atomic or Tito to whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Um, um, we um have and also thank you so much for the um whoever is watching it um tonight and then um later on on YouTube. You know, thank you so much for being with us um all the way along, um uh, from the twentieth and and you know over nine or ten days and um, so far in March. Thank you so much. And um, we had a question, quick question from Lisa, whether these recordings will be available. Absolutely, just uh, uh look up. You are not alone. Summit on YouTube. It's all um available there. And Neil's session tonight will be uploaded and as well in a couple of hours because I'm just I'm not in two hours so um, Neil thank you so much um, um, this this has been great and and um, all these um, you know honest the stories you've shared with us um, we, I, I'm sure it really you know touched many people's hearts tonight thank you thank you and um, have a great Easter break off to everybody watching and to yourself you deserve it enjoy your time eat some chocolate have some fun Will do, and I'll get in touch to have some tea totally um, social <laughs> once um, things are a bit better. <laughs> um, thank you everyone for tuning in tonight and thank you. Take care everyone. Bye.